Number 299. 299. <clears throat> Let's all sing. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my life. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music. My soul today, a carol to my King, and Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today. And hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now. For joys laid above sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Now, so we'll have a reading prayer. like to get your Bibles, it'll be 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him. Give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him. And the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we might know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Our most holy and righteous Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you instruct us, that you provide a way for us to know what pleases you. We thank you for your word to show us why we are here. The dilemma in which we find ourselves and the way that you have set to redeem us. 
We thank you, Father, that you have forgiven our sins and that we see your Son as our Savior, that we respect the sacrifice that he made for us, that we understand the love he has for us, Father, that he did not want us to be condemned with the world. We thank you, Father, that you have given us the avenue of prayer, that you hear our prayers, Father. And we make our request of you, Father, today for those who are unable to be here, for those who are mentioned who are undergoing trials, for those who are suffering physical ailments, Father, for those that are facing surgeries, that you will be with them, that you will do what is best. We place, Father, our faith in you, our entire life, our requests are placed in your hands because we trust you, Father, to do what is right, because we trust you to do what is just. We ask you, Father, to bless this congregation. Bless those who meet here. We pray for your children throughout the world, those who are being persecuted, those who are losing their homes, Father. We pray for those who are losing their lives because they say that you are their God, that Christ died for them. And they place their trust in you, Father. We pray that you'll be with John today, that as he brings us a lesson, it will open our minds to understand you, to understand the scriptures and understand what pleases you. We pray, Father, for your protection from evil. We pray that you will keep Satan from us, Father. Keep his temptations away from us that you will walk with us, that you will keep us safe, Father. We pray for our country. We pray, Father, that the leaders that promote evil will be cast down and that you will raise up righteous leaders that do what is right, Father, in their stead. We pray for our children we pray for our families we pray father that we will together build up the body of Christ we look forward to the day when we can see your face father and we pray that you will protect us until that day we pray in Christ's name amen, amen. <clears throat> number 222 222, the gospel is for all. <clears throat> Let's all sing. Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has done must go is grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go, is grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the heathen are at all, beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone, the gospel is for all. See? 
you got the invitation number yet? I have an officer second. Okay. Get that for you ASAP. We're working on a skeleton crew today, as you can see. <clears throat> you guys didn't pick up the slack near as good for me as my little kids did. Okay, thank you all for being here. We are excited to be able to come together as a church and worship to look into the Word of God and to better understand His will for us. And today, uh, I think this is a very important topic that we're going to look at because, interestingly enough, the Bible says there is a distinction to be made in sin. There is sin that will be forgiven, and there is sin that which will not be forgiven. I had uh, some more than one person come to me recently very upset about sin which had happened in this person's life years ago, but had been haunting them, and they did not know where they stood with their God. And one of the things that I told this person was, there's no sin that you could have committed that you cannot find forgiveness from God. <clears throat> That's true to a point. But the Bible also tells us there is sin which will not be forgiven. Now, we have the choice whether we enter into those waters or not. But let's think about that this morning. You know, there are passages like uh, James chapter 5 and uh, beginning in verse 13 where James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. That's encouraging, isn't it? Because we've all found ourselves guilty of sin. This verse tells us that there is a way to be forgiven of sin. Another passage of Scripture that I think brings great comfort in this situation is 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's very encouraging, isn't it? But now, <clears throat> we're going to talk about this passage of Scripture that Bo just read for us from 1 John chapter 5. In those verses, we see here in verses 16 and 17, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and He will give Him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. So there's a sin, He says, that does not bring about death. But then He says there is sin leading to death. I do not say that He should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. So you see that these two verses make a distinction in sin. And there's also in these two verses the command to pray for one kind of sin and the prohibition against praying about the other kind. If a person sins a sin which does not lead to death, we are to pray about that. If a person sins a sin leading to death, we are not supposed to pray about that. So obviously we've got to figure this thing out. To, to know where we stand and where our friends and brothers and loved ones stand in sin. So thank you again for taking the time to stop and think about things like this. I don't think that we'll get the full import until we spend some time thinking about it. First of all, let's define death. Death has more than one meaning in the Scriptures. 
One of the examples of death that we're familiar with is just physical death. When the spirit leaves the body, the body no longer is animated and alive. And so could we say from these verses that we just read here, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, then sin that leads to death. Could we say that uh, sin that leads to death would be something like suicide? Suicide is murder. It's just murder against oneself, and obviously that leads to death. Um, There's no coming back from that. Uh, If a person drives drunk, drunkenness is a sin, and uh, if they're involved in, in some kind of wreck that takes their life, uh, could we say that that's a sin that leads to death? Yes, we could in both those cases. Uh, drug overdose, uh, because, you know, again, soberness is commanded. Uh, drug abuse is condemned necessarily because of that. Could we say that that leads to death? Yes, we could. But... It looks like from the passage that that's just too narrow in its scope. It's just not adequate for the context of what John is talking about here. So in order to flesh this out, I'm going to suggest we go to Romans chapter 6. We're beginning in verse 20. Paul says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now listen to it. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. Now here obviously Paul is talking to Christians who were once involved in sin. Those are things that they're ashamed of now. Uh, One of the things that they asked me to talk about in Kentucky was addiction. So I divulged some of my past. I don't enjoy talking about it because I am ashamed of it. But there is real value in it because people need to know, for one, that you can conquer it and you can be close to the Lord after being close to the devil like that. And also there is some value, I think, in seeing that someone who preaches and teaches the gospel uh, came out of that kind of thing. And so I divulge some of those things. But with, with the caveat, you all understand that I'm very ashamed of the things that I'm about to tell you. Wish they never happened. Wish I could tell my kids and grandkids, Baba, Grandpa, or what, whoever I'm going to be, never dabbled in that stuff. Wish I could do that. Can never do that. And so, yes, I'm deeply ashamed of that. Paul says here, the end of those things of which you are now ashamed, is death. I don't think he's talking about physical death here. And as we continue in verse 22, But now having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end everlasting life. Do you see the comparison he's drawing? He says, Sin that made you ashamed brought about death, But now, holiness brings about everlasting life. We're talking about eternal death, the death that comes because of sin, versus eternal life that comes about because of holiness. The wages of sin is death. Let me ask you something. Does everybody that commits sin die physically? No. But does everybody who commits sin die? Yes, and I think that's what John is talking about in 1 John 5. That kind of death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. These things are being compared and contrasted. Eternal death versus eternal life. That's what we're talking about when John says sin that leads to death. Now, we're going to have to figure out Why would some sin lead to spiritual death and other sin not? So what sins do not lead to death? And by implication, we are free to pray for, pray about. 
Well, let's think about some. Those that are repented of. In Galatians chapter 6, as Paul begins that chapter, he says, Brethren, so obviously we're talking to Christians, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if a person is restored, obviously they're not dead anymore. Dead in sin, but then they were restored. So this sin did not lead to death. Sins that are confessed to God, as as I read a little earlier are sins that will not lead to death. 1 John chapter 1, and beginning in verse 8 and going through chapter 2. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let me ask you, what is the inverse of that? What if I conceal my sin? Well, we know what David said about that, don't we? That it was something that it just made him weary, made his bones hurt. It was only when he confessed his sin that he found salvation. If If we refuse and fail to confess our sins, we cannot expect God's forgiveness or cleansing. Chapter 2 begins, My children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I was uh, <clears throat> challenged on my pronunciation of propitiation uh, last week. They said, it's propitiation. I said, how do you say I-N-I-T-I, you know, initiation is what I was getting at. There is another way to pronounce this. That's the word, propitiation. But what's more important than pronouncing it is what it means. I want to show you in Strong's, this is the word halasmos. By the way, it's the exact same word as mercy seat, the the covering to the Ark of the Covenant. And you can see it means expiator, propitiation, and it means an appeasing, propitiating, the means of appeasing. What we're talking about, God is full of wrath about sin. And we need something to appease God. Jesus Christ, His sacrifice is what does that. When we call on that sacrifice, we can appease God's wrath. Now, how do you call on that sacrifice? Same way Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's where the propitiation is. That's where the appeasing is. So that's why John writes this. When we confess, we appease God's wrath over sin. The the sins that are prayed about, as we looked at earlier, uh, James chapter 5 and verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Obviously, if it's a forgiven sin, then it didn't bring about death. These are the things we're talking about that do not lead to death. The ones that God, the sin that God forgives, Hebrews chapter 8, <clears throat> beginning in verse 10. Here, the, the Hebrew writer brings up the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. This is in Jeremiah chapter 31 beginning, I believe, in verse 31. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts. I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now listen, verse 12. (coughs) Pardon me. (coughs) For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. When God forgives, He remembers no more. 
those sins obviously do not lead to death. So the question is, what sins do lead to death? <clears throat> sins that will not be forgiven, that absolutely are going to lead to our spiritual demise, not eternal life. Let's look at some. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. Hebrews 10, verse 26. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, I suppose you know what verse this follows, right? Hebrews 10, 25. <clears throat> if, you're not, if you don't remember right off the top of your head what that is, go back and read it. I think it's important to the context. The only reason that we have hope when it comes to sin is what? The sacrifice of Jesus. Here the Hebrew writer says, if we sin willfully, I think some passages here say if we go on sinning. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I'm going to tell you something. When you're in sin and there's no sacrifice for it, that's a dire situation. <clears throat> When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then tried to cover it up by murdering her husband, what sacrifice could he offer for adultery? What, what sacrifice had God prescribed for adultery? There was no sacrifice. The penalty was death. What sacrifice could he offer for murder? There was no sacrifice. The penalty was death. Only by God's mercy did David not die? There was no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice for sin here because a person sins willfully. Basically, they spit on the cross. You and I can be guilty of spitting on the cross of Jesus when we continue to sin willfully and we despise that sacrifice. So what do we have to look forward to then? Verse 27 a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? We know Him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Willful sin, where I no longer care <clears throat> about what God says about my soul, is a sin that leads to death. There is no sacrifice for that. If you refuse the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, there is no other sacrifice to look for. And I can tell you, there was a time in my life that I did just that. I became a Christian. But then I lived a life where I willfully sinned and just, and I guess the devil just got me not to think about it. I wouldn't even ponder it. But that doesn't change anything. Just because I refused to think about it didn't mean I wasn't guilty of spitting on the cross of Christ. And the th here's the thing about spitting on the cross of Christ. There's no other cross to save you. If you want to despise that cross, you can't find another cross that will save you. And that's sin that leads to death. Think about Israel. Numbers chapter 15 <clears throat> and verse 30. Sorry I keep clearing my throat, but I am having a hard time up here. <clears throat> Even with my special cough drops. <laughs> But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he's native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, because he's despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. I want to show you this word presumptuously here. It means literally, defiantly, with a high hand. You get the idea? A person who sins and says, I make no apology for my sin. I'm not ashamed of my sin. 
That's the kind of sin that Israel was guilty of. Also, uh, in Numbers chapter 16, this is what I was talking about in Bible class this morning. Uh, If you don't remember that, you should have been here. Number 16, verse 26, this is the rebellion of Korah. Korah decided that he and the 250 people that surrounded him should be just as important as Moses. And they rose up against Moses. And God was ready to just destroy the entire congregation. But I want you to notice here. He spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, And the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit. Then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. It came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So so they and all those with them went down alive into the pit, The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. What prayer could you offer for Korah, his family, and all the men that he surrounded himself with? There was no prayer. There's no prayer to save them. That's a sin that leads to death when there's no no sacrifice to turn to. When we turn our backs on salvation, sin leads to death. Hebrews chapter 6 beginning in verse 4, Hebrews 6 and verse 4. (coughs) Pardon me. (coughs) For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now, if I stopped right there and asked you who we're talking about, who would you say? Obviously, we're talking about Christians, right? There's no sinner that you could describe in those terms. And there's no Christian that you shouldn't be able to describe in those terms. I think it's obvious. So if a Christian, one who has done all these things, verse 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, this is what he says is impossible. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God... And put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. God expects results. And when He gives us all that we need and we give back to Him rebellion, then we are cursed. And there is no sacrifice for sin because we've crucified Jesus again. We're guilty of the same things as the original people that crucified Him. That sin leads to death. When a Christian is once again entangled in the sins that he came out of, those sins lead to death. 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 20, Peter says, If, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's that? Christians, right? If they do this, and then they are again entangled in them and overcome. Now understand, Peter's not talking about a Christian who has been tripped up by Satan and committed a sin... uh, because he's caught unawares, which we all do. He's talking about those who came out of these sins, but then 
They go back to them and not just go back and commit them, but they are entangled and overcome. They're back in that same life. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. How can anything be worse than before you became a Christian? Peter says it's worse because you became a Christian and you were exposed to all the benefits of being a Christian and then you gave that all up. You know, they say it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. (laughs) That's what I say. Have any of you gone through teenage heartbreak? I say better to never have loved. That's horrible. To love and have your heart stomped on? It's much worse because now you know what love is. That's what Peter's saying. You experienced all the benefits of the blood of Christ and you gave that all up. It's much worse for you now that you've been exposed to it and understood it. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. This is a sin that leads to death and it's pitiful. And then I'm sure all of you have heard about this blasphemous life and it has to do with the Holy Spirit. In all three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is pointed out. In uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 10. Notice there, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now, in, in Luke's account here, it makes a distinction between blasphemy against Jesus and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What what we find out is that Jesus was working by the power of the Holy Spirit. And to speak against Him in certain instances, like where He healed by the power of the Holy Spirit, is different than just saying against Him as a man. In Matthew chapter 12 uh, and in verse 31, I want you to notice here, Uh, Back in verse 24, Jesus healed a man who was both blind and mute. After He healed him, He could see and He could speak. And what happens is uh, that the Pharisees attribute that power. They They don't try to say the man's not healed, but they try to attribute the power by which He was healed to the devil. And again, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now that's sin that brings about death, isn't it? And Jesus says the reason is, They've completely rejected the only power by which a person can be saved. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And then in Mark's account, Mark chapter 3 and verse 28. Now, in the first six verses of this chapter, Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. And again, in verses 22 through 27... You see the reaction. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. And Jesus says, it was by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is more powerful than Satan and the demons of Satan. And again he repeats, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will 
never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. I have people all the time ask me, what's the sin against the Holy Spirit? Like it's this mysterious thing. There's, there's one sin you can do, and it's different than all other sins. Well, that is the sin. To attribute the power of Jesus to the devil, to the demons, the prince of demons, that is the sin, because you've given up the only power that can save you. It's like the doctor comes to you and says, uh, you've got this infection, and I can give you rocephin, and it will get rid of it. And you say, I don't want that. I want something else. And the doctor says, this is the only thing. Everything else is useless. And you say, I refuse to take it. That's what we do with sin when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit and get rid of its power. (coughs) Praying for those who are in sin, making intercession. We read James 5 and verse 15. If you call for the elders, he, he will be healed, and if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. You can do that for people who confess and repent of their sins, who are not obstinate and willful and uncaring and will not repent. When Job prayed for uh, his friends, God told them that was their only chance. He said, bring your sacrifices to Job. Job will offer sacrifices and he will pray for you. They had no hope. And it kind of reminds me of Acts chapter 8, and verses 22 through 24. You remember when Simon the sorcerer asked for the power to lay hands on people and give them the power of the Holy Spirit? What did Peter tell? What, did, <clears throat> what was he told? He, he said, Repent and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And what was Simon's response? You pray for me that none of these things you've spoken should come upon me. Abraham, in uh, Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7, prayed for uh, Abimelech. Abimelech would have sinned against Abraham and against God had it not been for Abraham's prayer. Psalm 106 and verse 23 talks about Moses interceding for Israel. And if you want to read about where this happened, it happened in Exodus 32, verses 9 through 14, where God said, just get back, I'm going to to consume all of them, I'll make a new nation. And had it not been for Moses praying and saying, would you you give an opportunity to uh, to the heathen to speak against you? These are your people. And had it not been for Moses' prayer, God would have destroyed the entire nation. Hezekiah prayed, for those who didn't worship correctly in 2 Chronicles 30. They didn't cleanse themselves, and they were doomed. But Hezekiah made intercession for them, and God then accepted them. Amos prayed for his people in Amos chapter 7. In fact, I want to show you this real quickly. Amos chapter 7. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings, and so it was when they'd finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Do you see the power of prayer on behalf of others? How about prayer on behalf of our congregation? How about prayer on behalf of our nation? Prayer changes things. Making intercession for those who are in sin, God will listen from the prayer of righteous men. And it's so sad in Ezekiel 22, verses 29 and 30, that there is not one found to make intercession. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. 
when God looks at our nation, can He find one to make intercession for those in sin? Can I be that one? Because eventually, God will say as He did of Judah, Do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, or make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. When that situation happens, the sin leads to death. The sin will not be forgiven. That's why it is imperative that we have soft hearts, that we understand sin. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and that we, we realize the cross is the only sacrifice for sin. <coughs> There's one here today and you have not yet obeyed the gospel. Do you understand that the sin which will not be forgiven is the sin that we refuse to repent of? The sin that we are again entangled in. The sin that will not go to the cross of Christ to be forgiven. Confess your faith in Jesus. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And He will save you. Your sin will be forgiven. If you are a child of God and you've lived in such a way as to bring despite to the cross of Christ, come back to Him when you come back, when you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you. If there's a way that we can help you now, or if there's something we can do privately, get with us later. Let us know right now while we stand and sing. Number 590. 590. <clears throat>